my folio holders and the speakers that we have here today. The purpose of our event is prioritizing the voices of the victims and for them to offer recommendations to the international community and governments about solid actions that they can do. These are all people who, like many in the diaspora, are missing family members back home, either unaware of their whereabouts or knowing that they have been detained, imprisoned, suffering without connection, without freedom. Our speaker series is going to start off with Jawar Ilham. Um, Jawar Ilham is the daughter of the Uyghur scholar Ilham Tohti, an internationally noted moderate voice who was dedicated to bridging the gap between the Uyghur people and the Han Chinese. Today is an especially important day as it is the anniversary of when Ilham Tohti was first detained. Jawar Ilham has been a constant and staunch advocate for her father since then, working tirelessly. As an advocate, she's testified before the U.S. Congressional Executive Committee on China, has wrote op-eds for the New York Times, and in December 2019, accepted the Sakharov Prize on behalf of her father. Um, Joe, thank you for being here today. The floor is yours, and go ahead. Thank you very much, Babur. Um, um, hello, everyone. My name is, my name is Jawhar Alham. Um, I would like to thank the Campaign for Uyghurs for inviting all of us here today and giving us a uh, platform to share our stories and the stories of our detained family members. Today actually marks the seventh, uh, seventh year of my father, Alham Tohti's detainment. And honestly, I would rather be remembering celebrations of the first, tenth, or twentieth anniversary of me, anniversary of me and my family's reunion instead of making um, the date of my father's detention. And I wish to come up to the camera holding my father's arm and smile instead of holding my father's photos and having to scream for his release like what I have been doing for the past few years. Mm, my father, Ilham Tohti, just like most of the detained parents of the speakers today, he was a scholar and an intellectual. He was uh, one of the very first Uyghur who was arrested. And he was also the first um, people who uh, holds a uh, Chinese passport that received a life sentence since the Cultural Revolution. But all he ever he ever, ever did was uh, fostering dialogue between the Han Chinese and the Uyghur people and for advocating respect for religious and culture belief of our people and for equal opportunity in pursuing our dreams and um, the things that motivates us. Eight years ago, um, February 2nd, 2013, um, yes, I remember the date very, very clearly. My father and I were on our way to America together. Many people may have already heard the story. And he, my father was to be a visiting scholar at Indiana University, and he was stopped at the airport and prevented from leaving the country. And I was just a teenager and also a freshman in college. I was studying Arabic, hoping to become a translator. And at that point, I was only playing, planning to stay in the U.S. for two to three weeks and help my father settle down. But I'm still here, as you can see, and never left. At this moment, uh, I'm on the other side of the world, uh, away from my family and my home. And also February 2nd, 2013, that was the last time I saw my father and my younger brothers. My father was released uh, home. Uh, uh, back home um, from the airport a few days after, but his freedom was still restrained. He wasn't really allowed to teach nor really be allowed to go far away from his apartment without a permission. In another word, he was under house arrest and that continued for uh, 11 months, more than 11 months. But my father never complained um, because it 
almost became a normality for our lives, uh, and especially his life. The Chinese government had detained him, threatened him, and put him under house arrest many, many times. And my father always tell me, uh, he, he used to tell me that, my dear, it's okay. It's okay. Let's be strong. January 15th, 2014, which is exact seven years ago, uh, 11 months after we were separated at the airport, Beijing International Airport, more than uh, 20 policemen broke into our apartment in Beijing and arrested my father in front of my two little brothers, who were four and seven years old at that time. My poor, my poor little brothers um, were deeply traumatized. One of them even had to suffer from heart, issue, uh, heart problems. And the poor little ones had, the, whom I was very close with uh, growing up, and they had to grow up without a father figure for over seven years. My stepmother had to raise two boys all on her own, and I had, had to leave away from uh, my family and uh, my father on the other side of the world for the past eight years. It has been four years since I haven't heard any news of my father. Family visits were no longer allowed. And since 2017, when my father was first, uh, uh, since 2017, family visits were no, no longer allowed. And in 2014, when my father first was first arrested, he was shackled, beaten, and denied for food twice. Each time was for 10 days. And I wonder what's his current condition now. What's what is so? Um, uh, what is it, why the government is not allowing our family members to visit him, and what are they hiding? And that makes me wonder. And my family and I have deep concerns over his current safety and his current health condition. Today, the motivation to um, do the work I'm doing is very personal. Uh, up to 2017, I was mainly advocating for my father only, uh, for my family only. And when I learned that hundreds of thousands of families were experiencing similar or worse treatment, and that was the time I knew it wasn't okay anymore, and I could have remained silent. And I really want to tell everyone who's listening to this webinar today, dear everyone, we can't remain silent. We can't. And today, I would like to urge the Chinese government to immediately release my father, Ilham Tukti, and all the innocent Uyghurs who are currently locked up in the concentration camps, re-education centers, or prisons, including the family members of today's speakers. And I urge the upcoming administration to enforce the uh, Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act of 2020 and ensure that uh, mandated reports to Congress are delivered, and I also urge the upcoming administration to pass and support the congressional enactment of the Uyghur Force Labor Prevention Act. And at last, I would like to also urge the Biden administration to center the Uyghur issue as an important agenda item in the upcoming terms. And now, the last message to everyone, uh, whoever is listening to this. Um, Please do not forget about the Uyghurs. Please continue uh, praying for us and speak up for, for, for the Uyghurs and all the innocent souls that are being detained wrongfully. I have a very clear direction and a clear goal, and I, I am working towards it. And my goal is very simple, which is to release my father and change the lives of millions of Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities who are now suffering. Um, from repression inside and outside of China. Yes, it is not only happening to people, the, to people who are, not, who are suffering is not only inside China. The family members outside, we are also suffering. And if, even if I can't save um, people's lives, I want to at least be able to work towards change and put light in, uh, in their heart and give them hope. So they will believe one day this this negativity will end. And that's what I also believe too. And thank you all very much. Thank you, Johar. It's a serious issue. And I wanna thank you for taking the time to speak with us today about your personal experience. Our next uh, speaker is Ziba Murat. Ziba is the daughter of Dr. Goshan Abbas. Uh, Dr. Goshan Abbas was detained 
by the Chinese regime in 2018 after her sister Roshan Abbas, the founder and executive director of Campaign for Oilers, spoke out against the increasing oppression against the Uyghurs. Ziba has been working tirelessly and constantly since then to learn of her mother's fate, to pressure the Chinese government, the regime, to give information. And recently it was learned that Dr. Gushan Abbas was sentenced to 20 years in prison in March 2019 after a sham conviction in a secret court. Ziba has been leading the campaign to find her mother and is one of many who are desperately searching for a connection to their families. Ziba, thank you for speaking today. Thank you, Pablo, for the introduction. And thank you, Campaign for Uyghurs team, for providing us with a platform to speak about our struggles today. All six of us here have a common struggle, representative of the ex experience of millions. And we are those who have decided to speak out as the only hope for saving our loved ones. Our pain has been compounded over millions of years of battle for human dignity that our loved ones deserve. On September 11, 2018, my mother, Dr. Gushan Abbas, was taken from her home to the concentration camp by the Chinese police. For over two years, we had no information whatsoever on why she was detained, her whereabouts, or her condition. But then just recently, we learned that she was sentenced by the Chinese regime in March of 2019 to 20 years in prison on fabricated charges. She's not a famous scholar or renowned intellectual, but her sacrifice for her family and her compassion for the people have been her honor, and her life is equally valuable to any. When I was a little girl, I often wake up in the morning just to find her already left home to help those people in need. I often fell asleep waiting for her to come home from the clinics. A dedicated soul like her was brutally targeted. She was used as a collateral to punish us, the ones who dare to speak the truth. She does not have an inch of malice in her. So the fact that a benevolent human like her suffering in a jail cell, helpless, wasteless, makes me despondent. She's a retired medical doctor, a non-political individual, speaks fluent Chinese, and has always lived a quiet life. Now she's in prison with no visitors allowed, having no access to lawyers. Just imagine being in a cell without anyone coming to see you for so long. I fear for her life as she carries multiple health issues that require medication and monitoring. My sister and I both have small children. Since the day that my mom disappeared, instead of focusing on raising our kids, we looked for our mother. We sought answers about her whereabouts and what had happened to her. I often found myself walking in the halls of the Congress, a place I never imagined I would be seeking help. I never could imagine that this lonely and painful path for myself. We are tormented by the lack of news and inability to hear her voice. All we want is for her to be there to give us guidance and be part of raising our kids. But the Chinese government took her away from us. They're depriving people of their families and their happiness. We worse in diaspora are living in torment, having to face the torture of no news or hearing news from afar about family members dying. Every time this happens, it sends a ripple, ripple of fear throughout the entire community. And this fear of repercussion has been used to attempt to keep us silent about the Chinese government's crimes. The impact on our community mentally and physically is devastating. Viewers are being enslaved in the factory across China as we speak. Families are forcefully separated. Kids are in orphanages. So many innocent people are being sent to the concentration camp. Why the world is ideal making me realize the grim reality of how powerful this evil that we're fighting against truly is. We're often unable to escape the feelings of guilt, even though this guilt should be on the Chinese authorities. We worry that our silence will not help our loved ones and also that our voices speaking out might cause them further harm, but we cannot be silent. 
I want you to take a look at the panelists today. Four out of six of us here, parents are in prison. Two of us are still looking for answers. These are renowned scholars, intellectual professionals. Do you see a pattern? If you don't call this a systematic oppression and elimination of an ethnic group, then what do you call it? I want to take this opportunity to say this to the president elect, elect Biden and the incoming administration. My mother's case is just the tip of the iceberg. As millions of others suffer similarly, it's clear that action at the current time is crucial. My mother's case is one that clearly demonstrates the Chinese government's refusal to participate in a genuine dialogue. While the Chinese authority have moved away from the harsh diplomatic style in the past few months, now give lip service again to a need for a dialogue with the United States. The transparency and regard for the human rights need to be part of such conversation still does not exist. If the Chinese government wants to clear their name, and if it's truly a country governed by the rule of law, like they claim, then they must free our innocent loved ones that are unlawfully imprisoned. The US government must demand the CCP to shut down those concentration camps and free imprisoned scholars, intellectual writers, and educators. The Chinese authority must answer for why children and grandchildren are living of torment without their parents and grandparents. I sincerely hope that our government continue to make building an alliance to confront this evil a priority and perpetrators must face justice. Thank you. Thank you, Ziba. Your compassion for your mother and for all mothers of Uyghurs who are missing is, is powerful. And so thank you for leading that campaign to free Gushan Abbas and to free Uyghur mothers. Our next speaker, Akhida Polak, is an Uyghur who was born in Urumqi to the Uyghur academic Rahila Dawood. Rahila Dawood is a renowned academic who, a cultural anthropologist, was famous around the world for her work. Akhida studied information systems at the University of Washington, but found herself becoming an activist, fighting to find her mother after her disappearance in December 2017. This activism has led her to become a full-time activist and advocate, joining the Campaign for Uyghurs team as our new outreach director. After that, thank you for agreeing to speak on this uh, panel, this event today. Thank you so much for all of you to attend this event. My name is Akida Pulat. I am the daughter of Rahila Dawood, an eminent scholar of Uyghur minor, ethnic minority and an excellent mother who has been detained by the Chinese government since December 12, 2017. My mother is a professor at Xinjiang University, born in Urumqi in 1966 to a family of intellectuals she became one of the first Uyghur women to receive her PhD degree in Beijing Normal University. She was also a visiting scholar at such institutions as the University of Pennsylvania, Indiana University, the University of Washington, and the University of California, Berkeley. She has received many awards from China's Ministries of Cultures, and she founded a folklore institute and shared her work in Europe and the United States, becoming a guide to many foreign scholars. She is an excellent scholar, but she is also a wonderful person. For my family, she is a responsible mother, wife, and a daughter. For her student, she is a kind and a caring teacher. For her friend, she is a humorous, open mind, good person with a great personality. The people like her should end up having a wonderful life in her age. But instead, she spent her mid 50 in detention center, camp or prison. I don't know her whereabouts. In a place that there are, there is no freedom, no hug from the family member, no music, no fresh air and know all the good things that all of you are currently enjoying right now. 
She disappeared at December twelfth, two thousand seventeen. I haven't heard from her or talked to her until now. She disappeared at December twelfth, and later I know she was being detained. I was devastated at that time. I cannot function for whole months, and then I gradually started my life in United States. I cannot let her to stay in that place anymore, so I became an activist. I am not the only victim. All the speakers here are not the only victims. Human rights groups estimated that more than a million people in China are detained in so-called re-education camps. Uyghur intellectuals were interned in prison or forcibly disappeared since 2017. Uyghurs have been forced out of their homes to work in factories that supply major global bread. Dozens of mosques and graveyards are being destroyed. The Chinese government denies their action and denies the genocide. But for me, a daughter that can't talk to her mother for three years and are spending day and night speaking up, it is a genocide. For my mother. That lost freedom for more than three years instead of enjoying her retirement life. That is a genocide. For all the people that lost their freedoms for several years, and even longer in camp detention centers or prison. That is a genocide. For a law-abiding citizen, accidentally end up in prison just because government suspect she committed crime without any clear evidence. This is a genocide. For all the people living in so-called re-education centers without freedom, fresh air, and hug from the loved one, that is a genocide. Not to mention, we hear news about people dying in those prisons and the camp. That is a genocide. There are so right now. We need your help to end this genocide. There are several ways that people and the country. All over the world can help on the Uyghur issue. First, please join us on raising awareness. It can be subtle things such as signing a petitions related to Uyghur genocide or forced labor, or telling your friends, relative, and colleague about what is happening on Uyghur. Social media is also a powerful tool in raising awareness of the Uyghur. I hope people can share the testimonies. Or article related to Uyghur genocide on their social media, so that more people can know what is happening and take action. Second, I hope you can write to your local official and inform them about the issue, such as forced disappearances, unlawful detention, forced labels, and many. Third, this is what I hope the foreign countries can do. That is to cause China economic pain until it reverses course. I hope country can stop importing products made by Uyghur forced labor. Multiple reports have documented products made by Uyghur forced labor in supply chain of major company, including Adidas, H and M's, and even more. Ah,、uh, we need we need your help. You cannot understand how much pain we are going through for the past several years. Before I came to the United States, before all of those genocide happened, I was a super happy, positive young woman that wanted to finish her study in U.S., go back to China, and spend my rest of my rest of my life with my family member. I am the only child in my family. But right now, I abandoned my careers in business analytics and become a political activist. And because I am the only daughters of my family, I am supposed to go back to my to my to my hometowns and take care of my family, my parents when they are getting older. But because of the genocide happened in China, it China is no longer a safe place for me. And for all of the speaker, for all of the Uyghur abroad to go back. So I, it is very hard for me to say. I cannot. I can't. It. 
it might be possible that I cannot even attend my fam my parents' funerals in the future. So we need to help. Please help us. For all of the people caring about the Uyghur cause, for all of the people don't know about the Uyghur cause and who wanted to learn more, for the countries, for the government official, for the international human hum international human rights organizations, all of you, we need your help. Thank you. Thank you, Akita, for sharing your personal story, your activism, and for working tirelessly and joining the CFU team to continue your work. Our next speaker, Arfat Erkin, is a student who currently lives in the United States and has been a vocal advocate and activist. Um, Arfat has been highlighting the atrocities being committed and specifically has been advocating for his imprisoned father, Erkin Tursun, who was a journalist and a TV producer for Yile TV. Erkin Tursun was detained in March 2018, and the Chinese regime has provided no information on his whereabouts since, despite Arfat's constant advocacy. Arfat, thank you for joining and agreeing to speak to everybody today. Um, thank you, Barbara, and thank you, everyone, who organized this event, and everyone participating in this event. My name is Ahmad Arkin, and I came to Arkin today as the Antichel's education as an international student. I was like, thank you both here. And um, in 2016, um, just like many other leaders, I lost contact with my parents. In, uh, and in 2018, March, my father uh, was a He was sent to prison uh, from March 2018. And I only learned that uh, five, six months later. And my mom, who was a math teacher at public school, she was sent to concentration camp back in 2017. Um, uh, for about years, there was no information about my father or my mom. And back in 2017, I was still thinking about going back to my home uh, after graduating from university, going back to my home and exactly as I like many uh, students did. In 2019, uh, I met with the Secretary uh, of State, Mike Conte, representing the students in America. And uh, then Chinese government came to my mom. But at the time, I also didn't know that by five, up five, five, six months later, but my mom was uh, under very critical class condition and she spent months in hospital. Uh, and there's still no information about my father. Chinese government made multiple statements. Uh, for example, they said my father was sent to prison uh, for terrorism, uh, even though their government record showed that just a month before my father was disappeared, the government itself warned my father as one of the best had grown as a part of this region, uh, for his works like that, the world full of love and science, uh, and science school. That's what, I'm really sorry to interrupt you. Your audio is a little muddled. Uh, it's kind of hard to hear you. Could you speak up or step a little closer to the microphone? Sure. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's a lot better. Thank you. And sorry. Sorry about that. Um, so since then, uh, since in since 2018 March, I still don't know where is my father, how he is, and Chinese government responded to United Nations, and their response and their statement uh, is very completely different about her, uh, uh, about my father's detainment. So I have been trying to know where is my father, where, where my father is, and I still don't have any contact with any of my family members because all my family members signed a paper saying they will not have any contact with me, and I don't know what will happen if I contact them as a consequence. So just like many of us here today, um, and this is a basic, uh, just like many of us here today, I'm just a student, I just came to United States from my university, I never had planned to stay here, but my father would stay because as a, a black boy and as a journalist, but also because he sent me my university education, that's what I've heard from the local sources. Yet I still don't know where it's my father or if he's still even alive because almost three years now, still no information, no English, no one ever saw him. I don't even know where he is. And I if Chinese and internet officials working this ID, hopefully have some subconscious and he is my father. And 
in regards to the recommendation, I would say that first, uh, shifting folks from the camps to the forced slavery and the prisons, because many data suggests that a lot of now there are more people in forced labor and in prison than the people in the camp. Uh, so I think uh, this is one of the things I want to recommend. And second thing is for the government to keep up the economic pressure. I read that uh, the new administration might focus on human rights and exercise human rights, but also it's a tension to China. But I think uh, economic pressure works on China very well because you know, just as we had seen last year when the human rights bill passed the US Congress. Uh, uh, Congress, this in a way, Chinese government said, oh, we will really graduate all the people there. And now they're doing the forced labor, so it's very related to the business and economic ties with China. So I hope the government's annual application can keep up the economic pressure. For the third, I think uh, my third recommendation of what I think is important is to, um, to, to get, get out of this, uh, get out of, you know, uh, stop limiting this whole problem as religious liberty or uh, having minority problem because the region, just like uh, she's on that's autonomous with gender in the best different as that, uh, the region, uh, Xinjiang is Xinjiang with autonomous without the China's constitution. It's an ethnic uh, autonomous territory. So ch just like China really taking away their autonomy in Hong Kong and Tibet, trying to do that, uh, they're able to be safe in the Xinjiang with autonomous region. So, yeah, it's related to, to the religious liberty, people rights, but also I think uh, things can be looked at from local dimension. And the last thing I hope uh, there is a hot of policy that I agree. For example, Dr. Gushana Abbas uh, has been, uh, Dr. Gushana Abbas was detained because of her sister, and the doctor, uh, and uh, Jolan's mom also detained because uh, uh, she studied in it, uh, studied in, studied abroad. And my father also detained because of the uh, Sending my university and this work. So I hope governments also take up this positive policy across the territory. Um, this might have been with countries and emphasize on those. Uh, it stop asking China to stop taking our tablets. Thank you. Thank you, Arfad. Um, thank you for being an advocate for your father, for Uyghurs, and also offering ideas and, and recommendations on how to treat the situation, how to frame it, and continue with that. Our next speaker, Jablon Shirmamet, is an Uyghur activist who currently resides in Istanbul. Jablon has been working to bring attention to the case of his mother, Surya Tursun, who he has not seen or spoken to for three years. During this time, he's been working as an advocate, not only for his mother, but also for his people for the Uyghurs and to highlight that oppressive regime that the CCP has implemented against the Uyghurs that's preventing him from reaching his loved ones at home. Jeblan, thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you for giving me uh, this chance uh, to speak out for my mother. Thank you, everyone. I'm Jelan Shirmamet. I came to Turkey for studying in 2011. I graduated from Stanford Arms University Law Faculty in 2018. I came to Turkey permanently in October 2016. Since then, I have never been able to return to my homeland because of the CCP resist policy. Now I'm living in Istanbul. My mother, my mother's name is Ria Tursun. She is 56 years old and she is a civil servant. She was an employee of the management office of the trailer industry in Corvas County. She was an accountant. At present, she is being a detainee in the Chinese concentration camps because I have studied abroad in Turkey. And my mother came to Turkey on a tour with a Chinese tour group to visit me and my school in May 2013. I last in touch with her in January of 2018. All my family members had deleted me from their WeChat account during uh, WeChat account during that time due to worries that my contact with them might uh, bring them trouble. So I also did not dare to contact them in order to uh, protect them. The last time I heard my, I heard my mother's voice was in January of 2018. That time she told me is she's last voice and their son studied well and graduated his good, good grades. 
I know that you are very smart. And also, please take good care of yourself. Please use moisturizer for your face as it gets dry. You look old. I always want to see your bright face as I miss you so much, my son. That is my mother's last voice. But but later the news uh, was passed passed me made my life upside down. I was told that all my family members were uh, taken to the camps in 2018. The main reason for their detainment was my study in Turkey and my mother's travel to Turkey. In 2019 December, my father Shir Mehmet Hudaya and my brother Irfan Shir Mehmet were released. My father was really ill. My mother was sentenced to five years jail because she came to Turkey to visit me. I'm not only speaking out of speaking about my, myself for my mothers and my family members here. Almost every single bigger student in Turkey has their family members detained because they are studying in Turkey or their family members visiting Turkey. I want to ask the Chinese authority if visiting Turkey legally was considered a crime. Why doesn't China pursue the millions of Han Chinese people who come to Turkey on a daily basis? Does not Chinese, China's constitution grant equality among all ethnic groups? Why would the only the Uyghur and the Kazakh Muslims face this type of cruel treatment? This is not only against human rights, it is against the China's open laws. China has never closed business. China has a very close business ties with, with Turkey, yet treat anyone who travels to Turkey as a criminal and detain them in the concentration camps. Is it because Turkey is a Muslim majority country and they believe in Islam? What does that tell tell you about China's intention? Isn't the clear indication of China's view of the world Muslim? community and the China's war on Islam. Open hearing about this calamity, uh, calamity that had come to my family, I contacted the Chinese consulate in Istanbul, although they replied that they would get back to me. They have not kept their promise. When I wrote to the Chinese Minister of Foreign Affairs, the only response I got from them was that silence. It is not clear to me if Chinese government is silent because they are because they are afraid of their crime, or if it, it is that they are so arrogant that I cannot do anything about their crime, that they do not feel a need to respond. After two months, a diplomat of the Chinese consulate called me and threatened me. They told me that my father and my brother refused to talk to me because they, so, uh, they thought I had a connection with uh, some uh, anti-China organization while I was in Egypt. This is completely lie. I have never been to the Egypt and I don't, any, I don't have any contact there. The Chinese government was lying when they told me that my family doesn't want to, uh, want to, me, to uh, want me to contact them. They also told me that if I admit, admit the, which uh, individual I have uh, had the contact with and the, which organization I have a contact and the, may, maybe they could help me to help my mom. They said that uh, then they could help me to make a contact with my family. What kind of threat there? Recently, I have been very vocal on social media. Social media, I have also been protesting and carrying my missing family members' pictures. On the 1st of June 2020, the Chinese authority forced my father to call me, trying to warn me to be quiet. But I won't be quiet, not until my, my, I see my mother, not until my mothers get free, and not until I can have a normally contact with my family. I beg every country in the world, the UN International Human, Human Rights Organization, please help me to save my mother, to free her, and to help me to contact my family. What I am asking for are basic human rights for my family and for all bigger families. How can, how can China be allowed to get away with this? And this pain is not just mine. It is a pain of bigger family across the world. Please listen.
and respond. Thank you. Thank you, Jevlin. That's a very difficult story to tell, and I want to thank you for telling all of us your story today and for being an advocate for your mother and for the Uyghurs. Our mm -hmm. last speaker, Kamal Turk Yalkun. Kamal Turk Yalkun is the son of Uyghur academic and intellectual Yalkun Rose. Yalkun Rose was an intellectual in a prominent one who was detained, unlawfully arrested on in October 2016. Kamal Turk and his sister since then have been advocates for their father, working to highlight his case through social media, through government officials, and more. Kamal Turk is also the General Secretary of Campaign for Oilers. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Thank you for your introduction. Um, I am grateful to the United States for its leadership in taking steps to protect Uyghurs from the genocidal actions of China. However, the pace of action is too slow. Each of us attending this webinar has a family member missing or imprisoned, and we worry about their freedom, safety, and health every day. My father, Yalpun Rozi, was a renowned writer, literary critic, and was the chief editor of the Uyghur literature textbooks. He was arrested in October 2016, and uh, since then we didn't see his face, nor did we had a chance to talk to him over the phone. For almost a year after his arrest, we didn't even know where he was locked up at and how his conditions were. My father was arrested for no other reason than trying to preserve Uyghur language, culture, and identity. It is frustrating to see that U.S. keeps taking one step back to two steps forward in its measures against China's crimes over the past few years. Although a climate of condemnation is beginning to form against China, the international community's regrets about what had already happened to Uyghurs during the past several years are more convincing than their assurances for our future. What we want to see is real action. We've heard enough pompous claims about how tough the U.S. can be against China's wrongdoings. Now we want to see a coherent and long-lasting policy formed by an unwavering government under a determined leadership. And I'd like to provide three points of consideration for the upcoming Biden administration. Uyghurs are an endangered pop people who stand defenseless against China's oppressions and violations and they can only depend on the international community for physical protection. So as a first step, the upcoming Biden administration should make it a priority to ensure the physical safety of Uyghurs by establishing safety nets with other countries to prevent the forceful returning of any Uyghur and other oppressed people like Uyghurs by any country to China. And it is worth mentioning that there are Uyghur refugees and asylum seekers here in the United States who have been waiting for more than five years just for their asylum interview, which is uh, truly insane. All they need is a chance to fair hearing to uh, express themselves in order to obtain a legal protective status here in the United States. The unnaturally long waiting period is not only excruciating, but not having a definite legal status here in the United States is hurting these Uyghurs, especially Uyghur kids and youth. They suddenly lost their entire financial support from their family due to their parents being imprisoned or taken into concentration camps by China, and they can't apply for federal, federal loans, FAFSA, financial aid, or Medicaid before they obtain a result of the asylum interview. And uh, Uyghur political activists can't travel to other countries to organize events and foster collaboration before they obtain the result of the asylum interview to get a travel document. And it is cruel to let these people wait for four to five years before even processing their application for asylum. We hope the upcoming administration can take meaningful steps to mitigate this frustrating situation. Uh, those Uyghur kids and the youth that came to the United States, they only came to study and they are robbed of their dreams and their lives turned upside down from the moment China took their parents and we hope the United States can help these Uyghurs who are affected by these unfortunate events and provide spe specific scholarships and the low interest loans and the subsidies to alleviate their financial burden to help them finish studies. Secondly, 
the upcoming Biden administration can use the power powerful legal tools it already have on hand to take firm measures against China's crimes. U.S. has the legal power of Global Magnitsky Act and Uyghur Human Rights Act, and it now depends on the executive branch to sincerely enact these laws and utilize them to their full capacity and sanction those Chinese officials and the business who took part or uh, was complicit in the uh, oppression, enslavement, and the killing of Uyghurs. We hope there would be more pieces of legislations about Uyghurs in the future, and we look forward to the passing of Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act without the eroding effect, uh, effects of anti-lobbying acts of big corp corporations like Apple, Nike, and Coca-Cola. My third expectation from the upcoming Biden administration is to take efficient countermeasures against China's big lies campaign. Repeatedly telling blatant lies had been a long applied strategy of uh, totalitarian government governments from the days of Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia. And China is perfecting this uh, strategy in, in this digital age of social media. And the U.S. needs to crush those lies. We are the living testimonies against China's lies. U.S. should create platforms for our personal testimonies and, most importantly, should provide support and make it an important agenda to strongly recommend Mr. Ilham Tohti to the Nobel Peace Prize. It will be a strong confirmation of Mr. Ilham Tohti's ideas, values, and the sacrifices in obtaining equality and the legal rights for Uyghurs, and would also be a powerful slap on China's mouth for telling unending lies about Uyghur human rights without a blush. We have far surpassed the stage of exposing China's crimes and hoping China will suddenly obtain a sense of shame to stop its actions. China is carrying out a long-planned systemic uh, eradication of Uyghur culture and the physical elimination of Uyghur people. U.S. has to take serious countermeasures and heavy sanctions and create strong alliances with other countries to punish China for their crimes and, and pressure China to stop the genocide release the population it held in forced labor camps, concentration camps, and jails for made-up crimes. All these require a strong, far-sighted leadership from the United States. America is the beacon of hope and the land of freedom. America is the moral leader of the world. When people are oppressed at anywhere in the world, the world will look for America. When America speaks, the world has to listen. If America fails to act decisively and to sacrifice their highest ideals and the beliefs in favor of a short-term economical gain in such crucial times as these, then America will lose all its credibility and moral leadership. And that is the last thing I hope to see from the upcoming administration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kamato, for your eloquence in recommending serious, concrete policy actions. And I hope that all the attendants here take the, that information and take action with it. Um, before we close off our event, I want to invite my colleague Julie Millsap for the closing remarks to our event. Julie. Well, thank you so much, Babur, and thank you to all the panelists who've participated today for sharing your stories and your recommendations and asks for both the United States and the international community. Um, as we've all heard from many of the panelists today, what is happening to the Uyghurs is absolutely unjustifiably brutal. The precedent that this sets for the world and for the future of continuing atrocities is something that must be swiftly addressed. Just as Kamal Turk just stated, while there have been a lot of positive developments, the pace has been entirely too slow. No matter how we might view relationships with China, it remains the reality that the CCP and the Chinese government are currently functioning as a dictatorial regime, wreaking destruction on any potential dissenters. The irony being that they are creating more by actions like this. As many of our panelists shared today, they lived quiet, peaceable lives before the CCP forced them to speak out for innocent loved ones. People like the loved ones who are mentioned today were contributing to Chinese society and to the world by their lives and dedication to their work justice and good treatment for all. When a murderous leader and regime sit on the throne of power, the international community can have no business justifying or contributing to uphold such power. This is not a matter of interfering in another nation's affairs. As the United States has been the first to significantly address the issue, we must also acknowledge that it hasn't been the last. 
Justice will come, but we must continue to push very hard. I often hear people saying that the United States should worry about its own atrociously evil um, affairs. And I'd like to point out today that there is not a comparison between what the CCP is inflicting on the Uyghurs anywhere else in the world at present. As you've heard today, this is also a US issue that is affecting US citizens and innocent people worldwide. By refusing to fight this atrocious evil, we set a dangerous precedent for our own country as well. By refusing to acknowledge our own business complicity in these genocidal crimes, we're not only failing to address them, but we are contributing to them as active participants. This is very much our issue to address. This is why this must be prioritized. Perhaps in the United States, because of our own nation's painful past mistakes, we can recognize what is happening. Europe should also recognize it on this basis. And yet we see so many leaders making decisions based on the short-term economic benefits that will be the undoing of the civilized world if allowed to continue. The brave individuals on this call today should remind us of our duty as global citizens. Today, on the seventh year anniversary of the day that Professor Ilham Tolti was taken away, we somberly recognize that we have been slow to respond to the signs of genocide. Just one year ago, our organization, Campaign for Uyghurs, was widely criticized for using the word genocide. Many people had a pragmatic desire to proceed with caution. And while this may be understandable in some contexts, we can now see sad confirmation, genocide is occurring. Not so long ago, millions of people in the camps was viewed as an exaggeration. Before that, the existence of the camps was denied. I would like to remind our audience again of the ways that the Chinese regime has consistently contradicted and changed its own narrative. To carry on with any semblance of the idea that China can be a trusted international partner to act reliably on any front is absolutely preposterous at this point in time. This is why actions like a genocide amendment in the UK are vitally important and already late. Yesterday, the CECC released their annual report, which details the somber realities of China at present. The suggestions therein must be implemented and swiftly. As you've heard today, many of the people speaking on this panel do not consider themselves policy experts. But our policy experts must listen to these voices rather than to lobbyists who seek financial gain above humanity. We call on the Biden administration and leaders worldwide to carry forward the momentum of previous positive developments and to push for even greater accountability for already too late to undo the trauma that has been done to an entire generation of innocent brothers and sisters, but we must stop the continuation of this genocide. I'd like to thank everyone for attending this panel today, and I hope that you will follow each of our panelists and campaign for Weakers on social media to stay informed and engaged and consider ways that you might personally be involved on these issues. We'll take uh, the remaining five minutes of our time here if there are any questions in the chat before we conclude, but thank you so much. Thank you, Julie. Um, as you said, we'll take about five minutes. If there are questions, we'll do our best to uh, direct them to the appropriate person, and then we will be closing this event. We Did have you... one one question that came in on the chat. Sorry, Bobber. Oh no. Sorry. Um, yeah, and uh, this question is asking uh, if the, I'm sorry, I can't read it very well, if the Jewish community uh, has been involved on issues and how any of the panelists might suggest that we continue to mobilize action from other interfaith and grassroots organizations. Perhaps Kamal Turk, do you have any suggestions for that? As to the involvement of Jewish community, there are um, there are many uh, active involvements on, on the side of the Jewish co Jewish community in the United States and uh, uh, 
also in the Britain, also in the Britain, uh, to help Uyghurs to promote what's going on, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, to help us like uh, lobby in the governments uh, to uh, to deliver our voices to the international community, and uh, we we be very welcome these kind of these uh, positive developments, and uh, we uh, appreciate them. And uh, also, um, the thing about why why it makes Jewish community so special uh, when they are attending these t- types of issues is because Jews are also the his- history's most most uh, oppressed, and uh, they are the vi- uh, they are the biggest victims of genocide cam- genocidal campaign during the past several centuries. So uh, their involvement in this. Uh, in uh, in what's happening to Uyghurs and uh, their support for us, that really means a lot to us, and uh, that could give us uh, kind of a moral uh, moral authority in what's going on. Because China is trying to trying to blame Uyghurs as terrorists, as separatists, and uh, they are they are uh, blaming like um, they are just repeating their big latent lies to blame Uyghurs for. for for actions that are sometimes not even committed by Uyghurs. So uh, blaming an entire population for the actions of just a few uh, people is itself incorrect. And um, this is just a very like commonly used strategy of uh, totalitarian regimes. So uh, when uh, Jew- Jewish communities showed its solidarity to Uyghurs, that really meant a lot to us. And we, Really hope that this could become a widespread moment that uh, Uyghurs can get uh, even further, even wider uh, support from other communities. And uh, one good way to actively involve in such campaigns, in such activities, is to share our um, uh, to share our tweets on Twitter, to share our uh, posts on Instagram. Uh, to actively share news about uh, news that uh, like credit party news that are exposing China's uh, atrocities and uh, to donate to our causes. Thank you. Thank you, Kamaturk. Um, the next question, um, Arfan, I'm not sure if you want to elaborate on your story just because of the audio issues that we had. But the question is just asking for some clarification. Um, um, what question? From Geneva uh, about your parents. I'm not uh, sure if you want to answer that or clarify. Um, uh, my father is uh, uh, TV producer and journalist, and he also directed multiple TV shows and so on. And my mom was an effects speaker at public school. They have been working in their respective workplaces for over. Been five years or so, and they didn't get paid. My mom really is on a critical escalation last year, but still very good information about my father. Yeah. Um, I didn't see the specific question, but. The question was whether both of your parents were detained. Yes, uh, my mom is at a concentration camp, but she, after being detained for over a year and a half, she was released on the critical escalation. But Thank you, Arvad. Um, the next question from Kyle Marston. What is something unique and positive that Uyghur culture has contributed to our world? Um, if I'll open this one up to any of our speakers, if you want to share a specific cultural aspect of our of our people. I'll, I'll go. Um, one thing I found very unique about uh, the Uyghur community is we're very hospitable and doesn't matter what kind of pain we're going through, we forever welcome guests and we will um, put on our best smile with our best heart and to, you know, welcome them. And this is, this is what I see. It doesn't matter how many, um, most of the Uyghurs now probably have one to 10 family members are locked up, but we still would uh, try our best to make our guests happy. And and yeah, this is something that I find it very unique and positive about us. 
Can I just quickly add something to that from uh, what the Uyghurs uh, contributed? The original Silk Road, all the ancient Silk Road, is uh, actually the starting point uh, is from our homeland. So the Uyghurs contributed to the civilization for more than 2,000 years, being the heart of the uh, uh, some of the ancient literatures and the uh, poetry and the silk and gunpowder. So if you just uh, Google uh, Uyghurs and the Uyghur history, there are a lot of uh, very unique uh, contributions that Uyghur uh, culture or history add. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. I just want to add that the ancient uh, part of the Uyghurs contributing to the civilization. Thank you. Uh, from Barbara, what specific things should be shared on social media and what other specific things should we be involved in? Ziba, would you be willing to answer that? I'm not sure if she's actually on the call. Um, it looks like she might not be. Uh, I was asking uh, Ziba if he wanted to answer Barbara's question about what specific things should be shared on social media. If she's not available to take the question, um, Johar or Arfat, if you're willing to. Um, sure. Um, first of all, uh, there are still lots of people in the world who are not aware of what is happening uh, to the Uyghur people and the Kazakhs. Um, and um, it will be very important for people to, you know, be willing to share the story of the Uyghurs or, or the Kazakhs of what is actually happening among their peers and um, educating your peers and let them know and mobilize them together to put on actions. And also one thing that I did want to bring up uh, was uh, as um, uh, Akida earlier's um, speech, uh, she had mentioned that there are still many, many brands of that are involved in forced labor. And there's one way people can uh, help, um, which is to um, uh, themselves personally not being complicit, which is not purchasing from the brands that are sourcing from the Uyghur region or using Uyghur forced labor. And you can also post about it and let your peers to do the same with you. Uh, I also shared a link over the chat section and UyghurForcedLabor.org. Uh, it's a uh, campaign for Uyghurs is also part of this um, uh, coalition and um, there are many information you can find on campaign for Uyghurs website or the end Uyghurforcelabor.org website on how specifically you can help and what has been done for, for from people on this matter. And um, thank you. Thank you, Joanne. The next question from Brian. What is the most effective thing for youth of Han Chinese descent to do in solidarity with Uyghurs? Akhida, uh, if you can take this question. Sure. Uh, thank you so much for asking this question. So during my activisms, I got man many emotional support from my Chinese friends. So as I always said in my activism, this is not about the nationality. This is about a uh, government atrocity so this is the uh, this the we are not fighting with the like any nationality like Han Chinese or any peoples we are fighting against the governments that the persecuted the per, that persecuted Uyghur now they are also persecuting the Han Chinese populations like de uh, several decades ago during the cultural revolutions so, uh, what so my suggestions would be first Please don't trust any propaganda posted by your governments on or your locals your local new, news because the gov the governments only want you to see what they the, the governments only will let you to see what they want you to see. This is what I learned during the past several years. 
And the second is if you have a chance to speak out, like for example, if you are a foreign citizen or if you are if you are if you can guarantee your safeties, please speak up by making some testimonial video or share the testimony on your social media and uh, like so, so social media. But if you fear about your safety or your family member safeties. I know how cruel, how like how cruel the Chinese government is. So if if you cannot publicly speak out, please just uh, maybe share with your friends, with your other hand Chinese friends who have doubt about this genocide. Please tell them what is happening. Like please, uh, or just provide some emotional support for your Uyghur's friends. And as I always says, like this. This what they what the government's done to Uyghurs, uh, like it's it it's not only harmful for Uyghurs as it's also harmful to the world to the stability of China or everywhere as a whole. So please stop. Please treat it as a human right issues, not some like Chinese in China internal in, inter, in, in, internal policies. Like don't like, please treat it as a global human right issue. And um, please, do, if you still have some doubt on the like genocide that is happening, please do more research. Talk to the Uyghurs abroad and uh, watch more testimonies. You you will find out. And uh, we are all humans. And uh, I I know it's like we can have the sympathy towards each other. Thank you, Evelyn. The next question comes from Brianna. Uh, where can we go to learn more about Uyghur culture? And I'll open that up to any of our speakers. If you know of any good resources or websites that people can visit to learn more, uh, go ahead and share it with us. You can also just put it in the chat so that people can visit the websites. Sorry. Well, I'll add that Uyghur Collective is a great one. I think I posted an article in the chat that they did actually about connecting cultures between Han Chinese and Uyghur, but um, they have a lot of great things uh, as a part of their website and social media as well. Yes, uh, I second Uyghur Collective. A very good resource for this. Uh, and it looks like the last question about which brands are implicated in forced labor with Uyghurs has been answered in the chat with the Australian Strategic Policy Institute website link. So unless there are any more questions, I just want to thank everybody for taking the time to attend this event and hear the stories of our speakers. I want to thank our speakers for sharing what is a difficult and very personal story and for taking that time to share it. And I hope that everyone who was listening has been inspired to take action and will in moving forward, think about the Uyghurs and what they can do to help. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.